In this video I would like to explain the functionality of servos and how to convert conventional DC motors into home built servos. A servo is a device that produces motion according to a command signal from a control system. Usually an electric motor is used to create a mechanical force and the servo mechanism rotates at a velocity that approximates the command signal. A sensor attached to the servo mechanism reports the motor's actual status back to the control circuit of the motor. Here you can see a servo typically used for radio control or small robotics and it is disassembled to show the components. The electric motor converts electric energy into movement. To amplify the torque of the tiny motor, a transmission consisting of 5 gear wheels is used. The total ratio of the compound gear train is 294 to 1, thus the electric motor must make 294 revolutions to every one revolution of the gear at the output shaft. The measured torque at the servo horn, which is the lever connected to the output of the gear, is 36 Nm, but what the torque of the motor is just 0.12 Nm, considering the mechanical advantage of the gear train. With increasing supply voltage, the torque is increasing too, hence we get a torque of 44 Newton centimeter at the servo horn when using a 6 volts battery. The angular velocity of the servo horn, commonly named the speed of the servo, is decreasing with increasing ratio of the compound gear train. We get 0.27 seconds for a 90 degree rotation at a supply voltage of 5 volts. The speed also depends on the voltage, hence we get 0.23 seconds at 6 volts. A potentiometer is operating as rotational sensor of the servo horn. The voltage at the middle pin of the device is proportional to the angle of rotation. According to the voltage output of the potentiometer, the electric motor is controlled by the board at the bottom of the servo. Servos used in small scale robotics applications or in radio controlled vehicles are usually set by a pulse width signal. The base frequency of the control signal consists of a 50Hz pulse strain with a duty cycle variation between 5 and 10%, determining the position of the servo. Most servos have a 90 degree range of motion with a pulse length of 2 milliseconds according to an angle of plus 45 degrees, 1.5 milliseconds according to the middle position which is 0 degrees, and 1 millisecond according to an angle of minus 45 degrees. The servos of different manufacturers behave slightly differently, thus the angle of rotation can be extended up to 180 degrees when using pulses ranging from nearly 0 milliseconds to 3 milliseconds. We get 2.4 milliseconds for plus 90 degrees and 0.6 milliseconds for minus 90 degrees at the servo shown here. Usually there are hard stops at the output shaft, limiting the angle of rotation. To avoid damage, you should not drive a servo with pulse signals causing the motor to press against the hard stops. The motor is drawing a high current whenever the rotation is blocked. Furthermore, the gear wheels might get destroyed if the torque of the electric motor is high enough. Most servos have a failsafe feature that powers down the motor if the servo receives no or too long pulses and the device is still connected to the power supply. 
In the video about pulse width modulation, a circuit composed of an inverting Schmidt trigger and two diodes was introduced. By choosing appropriate values for the capacitor-resistor combination, the circuit can be used as servo driver. With an oscilloscope you can adjust a base frequency of 50Hz by turning potentiometer number 1, which correlates to a periodical time of 20 milliseconds. By turning potentiometer number 2, the duty cycle is right, thus the servo can be controlled. You can adjust a pulse length ranging from 0.6 to 4.4 milliseconds. The servo horn is rotating according to the pulse width of the control signal. The base frequency is usually not critical, hence the calibration is not absolutely necessary. As you can see, the angle of rotation is kept constant, even while altering the periodical time of the pulse strain. Simply keep the potentiometer at its middle position. Now that we are able to generate the control signal, we will discover the functionality of the electronics inside of a servo. The pulse width signal has to be turned into a movement of the motor by the control circuit. The simple layout used in this video is capable to demonstrate the functionality. First of all, the pulse width signal has to be converted into a 0 to 0.5V DC signal using a low pass filter. The capacitor is permanently charged respectively discharged by the pulse width signal, thus the curve progression gets smoothened at the output of the filter. The smoothing effect translates the input signal into the average output voltage of the pulse width signal. A disadvantage of this simple filter is the ripple at the output signal, which can't be removed completely but made as small as possible. The higher the capacitance and the resistance of the filter, the lower the ripple. If the resistance of the potentiometer is increasing, the ripple is decreasing clearly. We can detect a ripple of almost 70mV at the output of the middle filter, consisting of a 33kΩ resistor and a 4.7 microfarad capacitor. The ripple of the left low pass, composed of a 200kΩ resistor and a 47 microfarad capacitor, is lower than what we can measure with the used oscilloscope. The DC voltage at the output of the low pass filter is following a change of the pulse width signal faster, the lower the capacitance respectively the resistance of the circuit. If the duty cycle of the pulse width signal is right rapidly from its maximum to its minimum value or vice versa, the DC voltage at the output of the left low pass filter is decreasing respectively increasing slowly. At the middle circuit, the output signal is following a variation of the pulse width signal significantly faster, however there is a noticeable ripple at the output signal. The values of an RC filter are always a compromise between those contrary requirements and as we will see some later, a small ripple can be useful. So the input signal is smoothened clearly at the output of a low pass filter. What happens if another low pass filter is connected to the output of the first circuit? Well, the signal gets smoothened even more. This arrangement is named second order low pass. Here you can see two low pass filters, each with a 100 kilo ohm resistor and a 0.1 microfarad capacitor switched in series and, as expected, the ripple at the output of the second circuit is clearly lower than that at the first one. Like at a first order low pass, there is, the higher the resistance or the capacitance, the lower the ripple. This second order low pass filter is composed of 220 kilo ohm resistors and 0.33 microfarad capacitors. 
The signal is excellently smoothened and the DC output signal follows the variation of the pulse width signal pretty fast. A high order low pass is optimally suitable to convert the pulse width signal into an appropriate DC voltage. The output voltage of the low pass filter will rise between 0 and 0.5V at a pulse length ranging from 0 to 2ms, considering a supply voltage of 5V. The DC voltage can be amplified by an operational amplifier with negative feedback. The functionality of the negative feedback loop was treated in the video about operational amplifiers. The required gain is 10, hence a 27kΩ ohm and a 220kΩ ohm resistor will do the job. The motor of a servo is driven by an H-bridge, treated in one of my previous videos. The motor must turn clockwise whenever the amplified DC voltage of the pulse width signal is higher than the voltage output of the potentiometer, operating as sensor. On the other hand the motor must turn counterclockwise if the pulse width signal is lower than the sensor output. The direction of rotation can also be different from the scheme shown here, for example if the polarity of the potentiometer is altered. A device suitable to control the H-bridge is a comparator. If the input voltage of the pulse width signal is lower than that of the potentiometer, the output of the comparator equals the positive supply voltage and the motor is driven with a polarity turning the device counterclockwise. Now the motor turns the potentiometer in such a way that the voltage output of this sensor is decreasing. The polarity at the motor is swept whenever the voltage of the pulse width signal exceeds that of the rotational sensor, by what the output signal of the comparator is brought low. Now the motor turns the potentiometer in the opposite direction, thus the voltage at the output of the sensor is increasing. The output signal of the comparator is either 0V or it equals the positive supply voltage, thus the motor connected to the H-bridge is always powered, turning clockwise or counterclockwise. To get a third state with the motor being turned off, a window comparator can be used. Let's assume the DC voltage coming from the pulse width signal is half the supply voltage and the output signal of the potentiometer is above that value. The signal at the non-inverting input of the upper operational amplifier is higher than that at the inverting input. As a result, the output signal of the upper operational amplifier is brought high. The situation is different at the lower operational amplifier. The output of the potentiometer is connected to the inverting input and the lower potential of the pulse width signal is connected to the non-inverting input, hence the output state is low. The output state of the window comparator alters if the potential at the potentiometer pin drops slightly below that of the pulse width signal. The output signal of the upper operational amplifier is brought low. Caused by the voltage divider composed of R1 and R2, just the fraction of the potential produced by the pulse width signal is attached to the non-inverting input of the lower operational amplifier. As long as the output of the potentiometer is just slightly below that of the pulse width signal, the potential at the non-inverting input of the lower comparator is still lower than that at the inverting input, hence the output of the lower comparator stays low. Not until the potential at the potentiometer pin drops below that at the voltage divider, the voltage at the inverting input is lower than that at the non-inverting input and the output of the lower operational amplifier is brought high, causing the motor to turn clockwise. Hence there is a voltage range in which both operational amplifiers are brought low by what the electric motor is turned off.
The layout of the circuit including the H-bridge is available on the project page. The circuit can be used to replace the board inside of a servo. Before connecting the electric motor, turn potentiometer number 2 and 3 to their middle position and potentiometer number 4 to the maximum voltage. The servo horn has also been turned to the center position manually. If the circuit is driven by a pulse white signal of approximately 1.5 milliseconds, both LEDs should be turned off. Shifting the pulse white signal in one direction lights up the green LED, while the red LED is turned on whenever the signal is shifted in the opposite direction. Adjust the pulse white signal lighting up one of the LEDs barely. As soon as the motor is connected to the H-bridge, it should be powered just for a short span of time, turning the potentiometer in such a way that both LEDs are turned off. Swap the terminals of the electric motor if the servo starts turning with full power in the wrong direction. By turning potentiometer number 4, the maximum voltage output of the sensor and so the maximum angle of rotation at the highest duty cycle can be adjusted. Potentiometer number 3 will rise the gain of the DC voltage caused by the pulse white signal, thus it can be used to adjust the neutral position. The upper resistor at the voltage divider of the window comparator is replaced by a forward bias diode and a potentiometer, both switched in parallel. The voltage drop across the diode is approximately 0.6V and it is independent from the DC voltage caused by the pulse white signal. By turning potentiometer 2, you can adjust the voltage range bringing both operational amplifiers of the window comparator low. The smaller that window, the closer the position of the servo lever to the set point. The motor starts oscillating around the set point if the window becomes too small because of the ripple at the DC signal or the pulse width input. The precision of the simple control circuit shown here is lower than that of commercially available servos. Furthermore, there is no protection against missing or too long command pulses while the circuit is connected to the supply voltage. If the voltage at the control input drops to zero, the servo turns in one direction until stopped by the mechanics. If two long pulses are applied to the control input or if it is connected to the positive terminal of the supply voltage, the motor starts turning in the opposite direction. Usually the motor isn't always turned fully on or off. When turning the lever manually, you can hear the servo buzzing. The oscilloscope plot shows the voltage at the electric motor, which is driven by a pulse white signal. Apparently there are no flyback diodes in parallel to the transistors of the H-bridge, thus there is a noticeable voltage peak whenever the motor is turned off. The duty cycle is getting larger, the more the actual value of the servo lever differs from the set point. As you can see, the polarity is altering when putting pressure on the servo horn in the opposite direction. Caused by the ripple of the command signal, the demonstration circuit is acting in a very similar way. When turning the servo horn, the voltage output of the potentiometer used as sensor shifts. Because of the ripple, the upper and lower threshold of the window comparator aren't constant values and the accordant comparator is brought high whenever the voltage peaks of the command signal are exceeding respectively underrunning the voltage level of the sensor. As you can see, the flyback diodes are suppressing the voltage peaks at the output of the H-bridge whenever the motor is turned off. 
Today, servo motors are no longer controlled by analog circuits, but by programmable microcontrollers. The size of the integrated circuit is clearly smaller than that of the demonstration circuit. Nevertheless, it is suitable to create your own servos. Here you can see the mechanism used to open the tray of a CD drive turned into a servo. The rotational movement of the motor is turned into a linear movement of the gear rod. The sensor is attached to the gear wheel, driving the gear rod. You can also use a linear potentiometer attached to the gear rod, but single turn potentiometers are usually cheaper. A linear servo can also be made of a threaded bar driven by an electric motor and a screw nut. The linear potentiometer is also homemade. It's a thick pencil line at the wooden base plate with the pencil operating as sliding contact. There are some combinations of electric motor and transmission bringing the circuit to its limits and above. Here you can see a compact geared motor with an overall gear ratio of 30 to 1. There is some clearance caused by the gearbox, affecting the whole system in an unfavorable way. The positioning of the servo is very rough. When lowering the voltage range bringing both outputs of the window comparator low to get a more precise positioning, the control loop builds up and the lever at the output of the gearbox starts oscillating. Besides the clearance, the high inertia of the long lever boosts the tendency of the system to oscillate. At the second run, the same electric motor is attached to a gearbox with a ratio of 400 to 1. There is also clearance caused by the gearbox, but because of the clearly lower revolution speed at the output shaft, the positioning of the servo lever is more precisely. Note the second order low pass filter at the pulse width input, which is reducing the ripple to allow using a small voltage range at the window comparator. Analog circuits are very sensitive against voltage fluctuations, which are inevitable whenever high power loads are switched. You can try to minimize the ripple of the supply voltage, but the accurateness of this demonstration circuit will always be lower than that of commercially available boards. Some later we will see how to increase the quality of these home built servos. In robotics, servos are not controlled by turning a potentiometer, but by digitally generated pulse width signals. A single output pin is sufficient to access peripherals with the servo, and by using a sensor and doing some coding, you can build a control circuit. Two servos are used here to rotate a small camera around its X and Y axis. The software controls the servos in such a way that the camera is always pointing to the brightest light. Servos can be modified to make them usable as very compact geared motors. First of all, the hard stops at the gear wheel of the output shaft have to be removed. At the servo type shown here, the calm at the top of the gear wheel has to be grinded. The second step is removing the linkage between the potentiometer and the final gear drive. The shaft of the potentiometer is simply cut off at this type. Without the physical stops and the linkage to the potentiometer, the servo horn can rotate continuously in either direction. If the potentiometer is fixed at its middle position, here this is done by some glue. 
the sensor reading is kept at zero degrees, independently from the true position of the servo horn. The potentiometer can also be replaced by a fixed voltage divider with a resistance value of some kilo ohm. A pulse swipe signal of 1 millisecond according to a position of minus 45 degrees will cause the motor to spin with full power in one direction... ...while a pulse swipe of 2 milliseconds makes the motor start spinning in the opposite direction. The power delivered to the motor will decrease the closer the pulse swipe signal gets to 1.5 milliseconds. And finally, the motor stops spinning at that pulse width, which correlates to the neutral position. As mentioned before, some controllers also shut down the motor at a pulse length of 0 milliseconds, which means there are no pulses coming in. The available range of drive speed depends on the motor driver circuit and varies between different manufacturer types. Such hacked servos are very common drives in small-scale robotics. This remote-controlled camera arm is actuated by a hacked servo operating as a winch. The potentiometer serving as sensor is attached to the pivot point of the lever, thus the angle of the camera arm is adjusted by the electronics instead of the angle of the servo horn. The lever is moving slowly, but in turn, the low electric power of the tiny servo is sufficient to lift the camera. The angle of rotation can be extended to more than 360 degrees by using two gear wheels and attaching the potentiometer at the larger one, while the smaller wheel is mounted at the pivot axis of the mechanism. The camera of the robot arm can do a full turn by what you can observe my whole robospatium. The robospatium is the universe of my remote controlled robots, you can try it out by simply using a browser. Another modification deals with the electronics of a servo. The board controls a tiny electric motor, thus the maximum power output of the integrated H bridge isn't very high. To be able to control high power motors, an H bridge composed of power transistors is required. The precisely operating electronics of the servo board can be used to control a power H bridge. The input signal of the high power edge bridge is generated by the output signal of the low power edge bridge at the servo board. The signal is coming from the two cables usually running to the motor, which cannot be directly attached to the inputs of our power edge bridge. The oscilloscope plot shows the curve progression at the output of the small signal edge bridge. It is half the supply voltage whenever the set point of the pulse swipe signal meets the actual position of the potentiometer. As demonstrated in the video about H bridges, such a device should never be driven by half the supply voltage or else a high cross current is running through the transistors. When turning the potentiometer in one direction, the oscilloscope displays two square wave signals one above and one below the midline. When turning the sensor fully into this direction, we can see a green line at high level and a yellow line at ground level. When turning the potentiometer into the opposite direction, the signals are changing position whenever the sensor crosses the center setting. Now, the yellow curve is above the midline and if the potentiometer is turned to the bad stop, we can see a green line at zero volts, which is low level and a yellow line at the potential of the supply voltage, which is high level. To be able to control the power edge bridge by those signals, we need two comparators and a reference voltage somewhere between half and the total supply voltage. 
A half bridge is driven by a low signal whenever the voltage at the related output of the servo board is below the reference voltage, which is two third of the total supply voltage at the drawing shown here. Whenever the potential at one of the output pins exceeds the reference potential, the related half bridge is driven by a high signal. That's demonstrated at the real circuit. The yellow curve displaying the output signal of the high power edge bridge is low, whenever the green curve with the signal of the low power edge bridge stays below the reference voltage. Whenever the green signal of the low power half bridge exceeds the reference voltage, the progression of the yellow curve follows that of the green curve, except the fact that the high level is at 12 volts and the low level is at 0 volts. Finally, the signal of the power half bridge is permanently high, if the signal of the low power half bridge is also permanently high. The circuit combines the precision of commercially available control circuits with the power of a home built H bridge. The layout is available on the project page. Some longer wire segments are soldered to the leads running to the potentiometer, so that the sensor can easily be attached to different types of servos. There are no adjustments necessary to operate the circuit, just note the correct polarity of the electric motor. The procedure starts with adjusting the home built servo to its neutral position. Now drive the circuit with the pulse width signal so that one of the LEDs is lighted up barely. When attaching the motor to the H bridge, it should start spinning just for a short span of time, so that both LEDs are turned off. If the motor starts spinning with full power into the opposite direction, you must swap the polarity. Once again, the motor with a transmission of 400 to 1 is used and the movement of this servo is very precisely. The servo speed is approximately 2.17 seconds for 90 degrees... ...and the torque is slightly too high for this measurement setup. When using the gearbox with a transmission of 30 to 1, this circuit can be used to control the servo at least at a supply voltage of 6 volts. The clearance of the gearbox and the attachment of the potentiometer still prevents a precise adjustment. The servo speed is very high. And the torque is approximately 33 Newton centimeter. If you like to build a high speed device with a high torque, you can convert a windscreen wiper motor into a servo. The electric motor drives a warm gear with a mechanical advantage of 110 to 1. The motor is operated with 6 volts because the speed is too high when using a 12 volts battery, causing oscillations in the system. A current of up to 3.5 amps is running through the windings of the motor, which is why heat sinks at the power transistors are required in continuous operation. The torque is around 260 Newton centimeter, and while the rotor is locked, a current of 3.5 amps is running through the H bridge and the motor. When using a larger mechanical advantage, the speed is decreasing, but there are fewer oscillations around the set point of the servo horn. This is a very simple gear train using a winch. The higher the build quality, the better the accuracy of the servo. I'm sure you can make it better. You might have recognized that the pulse width signal of our servo driver is not absolutely stable. Especially when switching high power motors, the servo starts oscillating around the set point. Digital circuits generate better output signals than the analog circuit used so far. 
Now the windscreen wiper motor is controlled by a computer. The lever follows the slow variation of the pulse width signal without any oscillations. Another advantage of using this tiny computer is the variable speed of the system. Whenever the lever must rotate for a large angle, the servo can be operated with full speed at the beginning of the movement, while the rotational speed can be reduced before reaching the end position. If the sensor reading is directly done by a computer or a microcontroller and if the H-bridge is also directly driven by the calculating machine, the resulting device is a digital servo. How to implement this will be treated in one of the subsequent videos. Simply use the circuits treated in this video to start your own experiments around servos. Thanks for watching and I'll be back.